Children's History Project interview is being conducted on Tuesday, November the 22nd in the year 2005 here in the auditorium of the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm uh, happy to be speaking with Albert Aronson. Mr. Please call me Al. Thanks, Al. Um, Al was born on January the 11th, uh, 1925 and he now lives in Niles, Illinois, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this Veterans History Project. So uh, here is his story. Uh, Al, when did you enter the service? Uh, April 13th, 1943. And what were you doing when you I was a you college joined? student at Wright Junior College. So, were you drafted or you enlisted? I was selected by my friends and neighbors. <laughs> That's what it says on the drafting uh -huh. form. Uh, another fellow and I, oh, we were very friendly in high school, went into service at the same time. I went into the Army, he went into the Navy. Since that, he's passed away several years back. Um, now, I was discharged in October 23 of 45 on the point system. So, why did you choose the Army? Uh, hell, I couldn't swim. I didn't <laughs> want the Navy. And the, another thing is, I was in the ROTC in high school for four years. And I did have a basic knowledge of uh, military. Where did you attend high school, if I may ask? Uh, Rosewood High School in Chicago. Oh, a Rough Rider. Right. Yeah. I even have a, a sweatshirt with that on. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's over there on, uh, what is that? Pardon? That's on Wilson and... Is it Wilson and Kimball. Kimball. It looks better now than when I went there. A matter of fact, this high ray was the first graduate court uh, out of this high school, uh, Roosevelt. Wow, that'll be interesting when I interview uh, Mr. Uh, Ray. He's, he's about 93 now. Very nice fellow. You'll like him. Yeah. So you were inducted in Chicago then? That is correct. Uh, I was given about a week leave to settle my affairs, which were that bit wide. And uh, they went into uh, Camp Grant and then was shipped to uh, a camp outside of Salt Lake City for basic training. Uh, basic training was Air Corps basic training. Then uh, I was put into the medical corps, which I wanted, and went to surgical tech school at Fitz uh, well, Fitzgerald uh, Hospital in Denver. And that was a two and a half uh, month course where you learn anatomy and physiology, uh, first aid, uh, different injections like hypo, et cetera, et cetera, and clerical work. Uh, and then you work a couple weeks in the hospital. Uh, then I was assigned to a uh, B-17 uh, bomb group that went over to England in October of 43. And I was with them, oh, oh God, how long? A good, well, not quite a year. And then uh, the uh, war in Europe, which was on the continent, needed med uh, uh, medical personnel, and I was volunteered by my commanding officer. I was the youngest and no responsibility, so they shipped me out. I joined uh, the 103rd Medical Battalion, which was attached to the 28th Division, 
and the 28th Division just uh, finished the victory march through Paris. And uh, I was with them, and uh, we went through France and part of um, Luxembourg and Belgium. And then we were classified in the quiet sector. Then in December of 44, the uh, SS Troopers Armor Unit uh, led the way for the German Army. The armor group did not take prisoners. They wiped them out. That was including medics. Uh, the medical corps are non-combatant, and due to a Geneva Convention, there was agreement with all the European countries that they were non-combatant, except Japan, which withdrew from the United Nations. Um, I was very fortunate to be assigned to the 103rd Medical Battalion because we were a clearing station for injured and wounded individuals. We served very little in the front lines. Uh, I had to take my hat off to the medics who were attached to the combat engineers. They took a tremendous beating. Um, now, the words we classify uh, wounds or injuries in three categories. Abrasions, which breaks out of the skin, you know, like a, oh, uh, something similar, maybe like that. Uh, puncture wounds, where a bullet would pierce into the, and then a laceration, which is normally done by scrapnel which tears out an area. Uh, those are the worst types of wounds to service. Um, the, you don't realize until you're like in the medical corps what happens to a human body when it's wounded or torn tears out areas, etc. Uh, now, when uh, the bulge was halt, halted and we start reclaiming area, what was heartbreaking were when we looked at the corpses, they were at different positions and so on. But what the saddest part was uh, corpses with minor injuries or wounds froze to death. They were not service, and it hurt to see that. Um, the dead was distorted, sitting up, laying down, uh, many different positions. To some extent, you get Im uh, immune to some of this stuff, but not 100%. Um, and I was I think around, I was about 19 or 20. So uh, it was sometimes hard to absorb, especially being sheltered, you know, in your early life. Um, we had a good team of medical people, the doctors and the uh, enlistment were functioned very well as a team. Uh, now, when we were overworked, the people that we could not help, they had to wait. We tried to make them as comfortable as possible with morphine, et cetera, and we would take the people that had a fighting chance and then we would disperse them to hospitals for 
further service. Um, it, it was a very, oh, quite an experience. I was overseas 21 months. And when I came back, I was quite disillusioned with the people of the United States. Uh, because a lot of them were making very good money. They were spending their money for amusements, etc. Well, there were some people that were suffering because of their dead, etc. But being in Europe and seeing children go into your garbage can for food, or and people living in the open or in the basement and thing like that, and then you come home and you see complete reversal. It uh, doesn't set too well for a 20-year-old to yeah. see that. I was very fortunate uh, to be discharged at the age of 20. I did make a mistake by going to college too quick in January of 46. Uh, I should have stayed out and worked and so on. I was not a adjusted for college at that time. I do have a college degree. I wanted to be a doctor. I had the experience in the field, but as to sit down and study, etc., I didn't have the capabilities for that. So I got a degree in uh, commerce at Roosevelt University. At that time, it was Roosevelt College. It was small. Was that on the GI Bill? That is correct. That is one of the greatest things they came out with because it produced a lot of good personnel for government and for business, etc. Uh, do I you have any questions? Or I oh, oh, sure. I did, uh, why did you uh, Why did you choose the medical? Cool. I wanted to be a doctor. She wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be take after my uncle, who was a doctor, and he was a captain in the Air Force. And uh, I had the practical experience, and uh, only two times I got sick in the army about from uh, the medical. When I first saw my first surgery, in in Colorado, and the second when we opened up a burned out tank. And as burned out tank, that sweet burning odor from human beings hit me in the face. And I got, I didn't throw up, but I got sick and I had to get into the wind to wash it out of my face. Uh, that's really the two times I felt pretty beat up. Um, Going into the Army, was that the first time you were ever away from home for a long period of time? Uh, that is correct. But you adjusted pretty well at the age of 18 to at being 18, shipped around the country and meeting all kinds of different right. people and types? Uh, you mature very quickly. You learn to survive on your own. But you did get clothing, food, and, you know, medical attention. Um, no one played nursemaid to you, and uh, if you didn't have money, you, you did without it. You couldn't come to your parents and borrow money <laughs> like you had it when you were younger. So you enlisted in April of April 13th. No, I was selected. Selected on April 13th, 1943. Uh, and then you, after the training in America, you get to England in the, toward the end of 43 or the beginning? October uh, 43. And that, was that, did you get to England by flying or by no, ship? No, by, by, oh, by the Queen Mary. Wow. Wow. Let me tell you about the Queen Mary. You had two meals a day. Uh, the evening meal was mutton, English mutton, and the breakfast, the breakfast was uh, eggs, uh, not fresh eggs, uh, powder eggs. 
you had a line up for the meals. It took you approximately a couple hours to get to the food, and by that time, the odor of the food, you weren't hungry. Good thing they had a PX aboard, and you lived on candy and cookies. <laughs> so the uh, Queen Mary it left New York Harbor and cut down to, um, what was it again, B, it's an island that starts with B. Uh, Bermuda? Yes, cut down to Bermuda and then cut up to a Scotland in one of their coves there. It took approximately five days. There was roughly about 15,000 troops aboard. And in the room that we had, our state room, was actually to accommodate two people. There were 16 of us. But what was good about it was uh, we had a porthole to look through. Uh, we say we waved goodbye at the Queen Mary, not the Queen Mary, the Statue of Liberty, and um, we went on our trip. Now the Queen traveled by itself because of its speed, and uh, it could outrun any submarine except if the submarine came head on. It had ACAC -ac guns on it and a six inch uh, gun in the swimming pool. Uh, I'll tell you very honestly, the ACAC -ac, uh, were uh, lousy shots. They would shoot up balloons and couldn't hit them. <laughs> <laughs> and I would do better with my syringe and needle than they could do there. But uh, the crew, the medical crew, was uh, American. Matter of fact, uh, I helped uh, run through about three or four hundred people with shots. And their needles, oh, were horrible. Some had birds, you hit the person and pull it out and blood go come out with it. But uh, we uh, worked out very well there. Did you have medical duties while you were on the ship? Uh, for shots and for, uh, you're going to, I don't think you would want to put this aboard, what we call a short arm inspection. Uh, we were called into duty inspecting the, uh, our troops of our outfit. And uh, that's about all. Um, I don't know what the medical detachment on the boat did. It was good duty for him, but uh, I don't know. So when you landed in Scotland then, yeah, you went by train or? We went by train down to the Midlands of England. And we were put on our base. Uh, if I remember the first night, there was an air raid warning and we all went into air raid shelters but it didn't come out anything our outfit i don't know how long it took to activate it and um to give you a little rundown on the um servicing of the uh, air corps when they returned from a mission if a red flare from one of the aircraft was shot, that means they had wounded aboard. And they would land, and we would go to the, with an ambulance, to the wounded area where the wounded people were. And we broke it down into three categories. If the man was severely wounded, he would go with the ambulance with a doctor and a medical man to the nearest hospital. The second, if he was not too seriously wounded, we would service him at our infirmary. The third one, uh, the, the uh, person was dead, we would take him to our morgue where he, he would be picked up. Now, our layout of the infirmary was set up as such, a morgue 
to wards, small wards, a uh, emergency room, a sick call area, and the administrative. I was in the sick call area. Uh, we would handle the sick call and injuries, et cetera, in that area. Uh, I think it was in July, July of 44, where they, want, they needed people, medical people, in the uh, uh, continent. And that's where I got attached to the 103rd Medical Battalion, which was part of the 28th Division. The 28th Division was the National Guard uh, outfit out of Pennsylvania. Their uh, shape of their, of their uh, I, it doesn't show on here, it doesn't show on the arm, it's on the other arm is a um, what, keystone stone. Like in a stake? ancient yeah. time, uh, rather medieval times, they didn't have the, uh, concrete, and they used to insert it into that area. That, uh, the Continental, the reason for the, that emblem for, the 20, uh, for Pennsylvania, it was in the middle of the colonies and uh, they held their uh, meetings there to Congress, yeah. etc. And it was known as the Keystone State. Uh, I don't think the division is still in, uh, in servicing. Uh, I think they broke it down into a different setup. The medical, rather the cert the army setup is so much different than when I was in. Um, when that, when the German SS tank, whatever it was, spearheaded, that was the bulge offensive, right? That is correct. How close did they get to where your headquarters were or your camp? Really, I'll tell you something funny. When you're in a unit, you're in that Pacific area, you do not know where the other units are. Now, we had a 106th Division. It just came over from the States two weeks before. They were ill-equipped, didn't have any training, and that's where the Germans came through. In the first week of combat, they lost 7,500 men, which is about a regiment, because there's about approximately 15,000 soldiers in a uh, division, and there's three regiments there plus attached units like our medical unit. And um, so the armor went through, they, had, they couldn't take prisoners, to be honest, would be, they had, were in, on a time schedule. And they just wiped them out. They were medic or not, they wiped you out. Uh, let me put it this way, the, we return to hospitality. It's the animal that comes out. Now, when the war was near the end, we went on occupational duty. Being a medic, we supervised a PW camp, which were German prisoners. They separated the SS from the regular German. The, the German prisoners dug into the ground for shelter and they used whatever they could above it. We did not help them at all. And my division was on guard duty, and they had no love for the SS. And uh, in the compound, you had an eight-foot wire fence. Then approximately three feet from there, you had a, oh, about two and a half, three feet high fence. If you touch this fence there, a guard will yell, halt, three times. And if you didn't halt, you were dead. Uh, practically every morning, we would find a couple of dead prisoners, mostly SS. Uh, the, uh, when you're in the armed forces, you turn into an animal. And uh, 
Now, I have a buddy, he and I uh, used to lecture my, in my daughter's class. He was with the Third Army, and he being Jewish like I am, he could speak it. His outfit called for Jewish soldiers to go with and go into a concentration camp. And uh, the Jewish concentration camp, matter of fact, an SS trooper was going to shoot him, but he let him have first and wiped him out. He has souvenirs from this person. Uh, he went into the service oh, at 17 with the okay of his parents and on the second day of D-Day he landed and he was attached to the Third Army and he was up on the boat when they relieved uh, Bastogne. Um, the boat was a real mess. It was crazy. It was your heavy fog and very cold, misty, and you could get no air support because of the uh, cloudiness. Um, it was a strange thing. You would hear German in back of you, in front of you, or English, the same thing. They were as screwed up as we were. <laughs> um, it, it was a, a total mess. They say the boat was the biggest loss of personnel that we ever suffered. The Germans suffered more. They claimed that I think it was our losses were about 80,000 wounded, killed, and captured. The Germans, they claimed, was about 120,000. It was a reading a uh, report on it. No, I saw it on the History Channel that the German schedule was way behind because they were going through woods in flat areas different. And uh, they ran out of petrol and so on. And then uh, we were getting people to reinforcements, which were cooks, clerical help, didn't know which end of the, of the rifle you used, and a lot of trench foot. Uh, they would bring them back into our area, and we would take the shoe off, and the foot would swell into a redness or a bluish appearance. And all you could do was wash them and so on. And then we would ship them back to a different area for servicing. There must have been a hell of a lot of amputations because when gangrene sets in, uh, it's hard to control except through amputation. Uh, after a while, we didn't take the shoe off. We just shipped them right back because it was superfluous to do it, and there was more important things to do. And um, it was a shame, especially a lot of these people that didn't know how to take care of it. Now myself, I used to carry two pairs of socks in my helmet and try to change my uh, socks every other day or something like that, then uh, try and wash out the other ones and then put them out to freeze, <laughs> and then eventually you were able to wear them again. But um, being in the medical battalion was much easier than being up in front in the uh, combat area. And you, it was quite gruesome, the wounded, etc. cetera. Uh, but up in front, it was much worse, much worse. And uh, one thing about the German army, when they brought in reinforcements, they would pull out the whole group and form a, uh, uh, a unit. 
Well, I'm not in American troops. You're, you learn on the job training, and the casualties were such a, were larger that way. Did you, um, were you able to stay in touch with the people at home, with mail or? Yeah, the uh, email where you wrote out and they made photostats and mailed, uh, sent it back to the states. They were, I'm sorry, sure, but they're about that big when they're uh, reproduced. But the film is about that long. And uh, you, I used to write as often as, as I could to keep up the morale at home. Um, that was V-mail. A V-mail, yeah, right. Yeah. If you wrote a letter, if you're lucky, they would get it home maybe in a month. With this female, within a week. I don't know, you know, that's all I know about. I don't know whether they went by mail or went transmitted. I don't know the process. But uh, it was very handy. Um, we had to have it okayed by an officer, censored by it. But our officers, they didn't give a damn. They just okayed it and yeah. went through. So when were you crossed into Germany? Yeah. And you were there for some of the occupation, right? Yeah. Where did you, where were you stationed in We were in Germany? stationed in an occupational area near Essen, Germany. Uh, later on, or oh, say a month or two months after the war, no, well, less than that. The war ended in May. Uh, I'd say a month before the war ended, uh, this area was going to be occupied by the British, and the British moved down. Uh, we went to a resort area, which was rehabilitation area for the Germans. And uh, we, put out, we stayed there for the remainder of the time. And a day before the surrender, we were notified that it was going to occur. We set out our vehicles for all kinds of liquor. <laughs> and they brought it back. And the uh, funny thing about it, the following day, I had KP. <laughs> so we got lit pretty well the night before. And the Germans could have taken the town and such <laughs> without any trouble. So I showed up around 11 o'clock for KP, and one of the cooks came down about the same time. We looked at each other. Nobody around would be right back to sleep. Uh, then, uh, was it June or July? Wait a minute. June or July, our division was moved to France. Uh, to be sent back home for rehabilitation, recuperation leave, then to be tra uh, trained for the Pacific. Uh, I was home in August when they dropped the two bombs in Japan, and they, uh, Japan gave up. And then when I was called after my leave, I went back to the base and uh, the point system went into effect, and I had ample points for discharge. So you were discharged from? Uh, down in uh, Florida. I originally went back to the base in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which uh, Camp Shelby, which held about four divisions. And at that time, they could not service us with the points and the uh, Senate of Flor uh, uh, Florida, I think it was Camp Johnston, which was an amphibious uh, training area. And we were discharged from there. Uh, funny thing about it, back in 51, when I was a salesman on the road, I went back to Mississippi to the Hattiesburg area. And the area where we were stationed was strictly fields. No, no indication yeah. of a military base at all. And uh, it was quite strange. Yeah. And uh, 
Did you ever go back to Europe after the war? Uh, yes, I won a free trip to the Riviera, being a, as a salesman. Prior, oh, I'm sorry, prior to that, uh, we sent my kids, when my older daughter graduated college, we sent her and my youngest daughter a free college uh, uh, a gift for going to Europe. They went as students and they had a ball for a month. And he, I think it cost us about $2,000 for both of them for a month. Can yeah. you visualize that? Yeah, not today, huh? And they were at camps and hostels and so on. Then uh, we took them back to England and we went to where I was stationed. In, in the Midlands? England. Uh, was that in the Midlands where you were stationed, you were saying? No, no. We took the kid back. Yeah. To where you had been stationed. When it, where, yeah, and around that area. Then, uh, then my wife and I, several years afterwards, went to England, Scotland, and uh, toured what I went through. Then, uh, I think about six years ago, we went to Paris. Uh, the only time I saw Paris when I was in service, when I waved at the Eiffel Tower, and we spent time there and we went over to Normandy. Uh, what impressed me at Normandy when the rangers went up this cliff and we were on top of the cliff and we looked down and I couldn't visualize them coming up that cliff. They took hell of a casualties. The reason they went up to that cliff was that the Germans were supposed to put a, a large uh, cannons on it, but they never did. They just had a, uh, a fighting group up there. Now, they did not do anything to this uh, area. You could see the bomb shelters and so on. Uh, most of Normandy was pretty well cleaned up, except the Utah Beach, which they kept it like it was an invasion time. We never did get up there. That was south of Shelburne. Uh, we uh, went to where the British landed, and uh, the town that the British took was 80% destroyed and had to be regrouped. Now, they also had, uh, I think, Sometime in June, later June, uh, there was the weather was horrible, and they had uh, to put in breakers, and they still had those breakers uh, in the British section where they uh, brought in their supplies. They expected to pick up Shellburg, but they held up longer than they expected. Uh, The beachhead, from what I gather, was about 50 miles long. As I say, the British and the American Normandy uh, beachhead was straight west, and Utah was sort of um, south. And I heard that was quite a messy uh, engagement there. In um you received uh, a number of medals and citations for your service. Oh, I have about five medals, five battle stars. That's about it. Oh, and a unit citation. Yeah, I think it's important if you could point yeah, those out. Yeah. There's the unit citation. There's my rupture deck or discharge. Uh, all my ribbons, I have a couple more that's been added. Infantry uh, medic uh, combat that where we were actually not in combat and the PFC You know what that stands for PFC private first class? No, no poor frightened civilians <laughs> Very good. Very good. Is that, that's about all. So you have I, the silver. What is it? Silver? I was far from being a hero. Well, you have a silver star. Is that right? 
No, five battle of stars, which five was, which constitutes a silver silver star. Yeah. yeah. I have no purple hearts. One fellow in our outfit. We were in an artillery barrage, and he was sitting on the fence at that time, and he fell off the fence. He got a purple heart. <laughs> we were very envious of him because that was five points <laughs> for towards discharge. How many points did you need for discharge? Seventy-six. Seventy-six. Uh, what it is, uh, the 21 months overseas counted as two uh, uh, points. And then my battle stars each counted for five, and the length of service and the service in the States. I was in the States for about six months, and that was one point per month there. Uh, I, I think I was one of the youngest to be discharged from service, not being 21. Did you gain weight while you were in the service or lose uh, weight? I'll tell you, want me to tell you something? When I went into service, I was 145 pounds, 5'8 in height. When I got discharged, I was 175 pounds, 6 foot. Wow, you had a growth spurt in there. Oh, huh? I was a slow grower. Yeah. Uh, but you want me to tell you something right strange right now? I am at 163 pounds. Wow. And uh, I think about 5'11, shrugged about an inch. Um, so when you, um, when they came back stateside, yeah. uh, you mentioned that you were slightly disillusioned with the Very much other civilians. Not slightly, were, quite a bit. Yeah. But um, you adjusted to that and. Went to college. You know, I'll be very honest with you. It, the adjustment had from six to a year, uh, months to a year, and I, as I say, had no business going to college. I was not ready for it. I should have taken a job and uh, matured more. It's. Uh, Certain things that are imprinted in your head over like, as I say, 21 months and know and seeing things that majority of the people in the United States have never seen and I hope they never will, except up in New York that one time and in Washington. But um, sometimes it brings people back to reality to have a certain amount of hardship. Uh, I just hope that our people are not too soft. You know, when you sit back and you think about what's going to be with generations to come, will we become very implacable with uh, uh, what we have? Do we? Now, the people who are in service right now are in combat, they know what they to what they are in those. And um, I tell you, this guerrilla warfare is rough stuff. Uh, we had a little bit of it, uh, our outfit, when they went into towns to take over the towns and villages and you had snipers and you had hand grenades flying around. We were very fortunate. Our unit was on a good many outskirts of these towns and didn't really get involved. Actually, we only lost one uh, medic and that was due to a sniper. We wore helmets which had a round white background with red crosses. I don't know whether you see movies with them. And this sniper hit the center of the red cross and wiped the man out. That was about the only casualty we had. And, and we were a little leery about wearing those helmets again because they st uh, They stood out and gave it oh, man, a target. Beautiful target. Uh, for when I gathered 
the uh, medics with the combat engineers did not wear those helmets because they would give away positions to the enemy. And uh, we had armbands too, and they didn't wear either. When you came back to the States, did you maintain any friendships with people you had met in the service? Uh, not very much. Did you join any veterans? I joined groups? the American Legion, the VFW. I went to some of their meetings, and they landed up playing poker. Five minutes of meeting, and two hours of poker, and that wasn't for me. Uh, also, I stayed in those VFW. W American Legion because uh, it was beneficial to my sales job because I used to call I on the yeah. clubs. I later joined the Jewish War Veterans and I got disillusioned with them too. Uh, but they were a little more active in the welfare of uh, the American soldier and etc. The maybe this is a sensitive question, and I maybe I shouldn't answer. Go ahead. Did you encounter any anti-Semitism when you were in the army? Oh, I had a couple of fights. Uh, matter of fact, I'm very fortunate. I won them both. Very good. Yes. One one fellow was the. This is odd as hell. I hate to say it, nationality was Polish descent, and we went out and we start fighting. And he said to me, you can't hurt me in the stomach. I said, no. So I went for the face. I got his face bloody. And when it got bloody, it was time for him to quit. And the other one was a stroopy wrestling match. It was uh, when I was going to uh, tech school. And that was broken up by the people around there. That was in the, in, in the States? That, yeah, that was in the cool. States. One was in the States, one was in Germany. Uh, two GIs fighting was not good morale for the German people to see, but that was it. Uh, what was a very, very, very sad thing is to see a truck drive by with uh, mattress covers. And in the mattress covers were uh, corpses. And they were filled up. Al was describing what a sad scene it is to see the trucks passing by with mattress covers filled with corpses. corpses. It, you just stood there and looked. You didn't say a word, and you just watched them go by. And uh, it was a very sad situation. That was when the war was over and they were moving them. Um, we were going way ahead. When we were in Normandy, my wife and another couple, we visited a Normandy uh, cemetery, American cemetery, which has close to 10,000 graves in it. And we went into this area, and we saw these gravestones, all different a angles, perfect in any angle you look. And there was a heavy quietness there, and people did not talk loud. They whispered. They had a, uh, a building, which I went into, and it was a computer area. And if you wanted some history about a uh, anybody, you could ask about. We lost one fella who was taken prisoner during the bullet, and he was in a camp. And Germans normally put the camps near a military installation or a industrial installation, and. They felt that the Americans would not bomb the group. Well, they set in a group of precision bombers, and it so happened they hit the, the camp also, and he was killed. They never recovered his body. 
So about 50 years later, I went into this building to get a printout on them. And they gave me the printout, and I looked at it. You believe I choked up when I read that printout about him? And matter of fact, they gave out a, a book of all the graves around the world, cemeteries around the world, and I was reviewing it. And do you know that between World War I and II, there's over a million American graves in Europe? No. Uh, he, uh, getting back to this fellow, since they were unable to recover his body, they call him missing in, in uh, combat, MIA. His name is engraved on a wall in a cemetery near the Battle of the Bulge. And um, when I got this printout, I made copies for my friends. There was about 15 of us that uh, were in this high school club plus him. And only about eight or nine of us got together. And I gave a printout to each one of them. And, and also a picture of where the cemetery was. And you know, you could hear a pin drop when they looked at it. Um, this group, there were seven of us that played poker once a month. Wow, is this the Roosevelt ROTC group? No, just Roosevelt High School. Just Roosevelt High School. A matter of fact, we inherit one player from Von Steuben and one uh, from one of the fellow's younger brothers joined us because we had a couple of casualties in our group. And um, here are guys, 1881, who don't act the rage. I mean, we, we talk about things, but age was no, is nothing or health. Is, and, it, and we don't play for large stakes. It's just the getting together. And also what's strange about this is the only socializing we do. We do not go out with wives and so on. At one time we did. And uh, we, Roosevelt High, Sc High School has an annual paper and uh, it tells the history of people that were active in there. As a matter of fact, we have an entry about our poker play and about the couple of fellows that passed away. Um, it's, it's quite intriguing, uh, that paper. This paper is put out by a former teacher of Roosevelt. God, he, and he has a staff of former Roosevelites working with him. And he says it cost about $3,000 an issue. As I it's put out semi-annual. And so we donate to keep it going and other little f uh, things for uh, to be entered into the paper. It's uh, very remarkable. I, I would have brought it, but I let my sister read it because she graduated before I did from Roosevelt. So uh, it's... So were there, were, were there ever any reunions of, the, of your group, the medics or the 103rd, that you attended Army, reu Army reunions or...? Uh, for my gather, there's meetings, but I don't get any information from them. They're active somewhat. Uh, let's put it this way. I'm one of the youngest, so I imagine the majority of them have passed away. Yeah. So um, the last section here, some of the recommended questions, and I... I oh, think I, you, I'm sorry. I, I, I think you touched... Like... No, not at all. I think you touched upon this about how your service and experiences affected your life. Like you... Well, probably affected the decision about being a doctor or not, I would say. Well, I found out that I have the physical characteristics to be a doctor, but not the mental, to book learn, etc. 
I could have been a uh, some kind of a technician, but there was no money in it. So uh, sales was I made a fair income. It taught me to uh, be able to improvise. Uh, if you, I would say the younger people are more intelligent than we were, but they don't know how to improvise. And uh, we learned to improvise on things. That's what we had over the Germans, is if their officers were dead, the troops were not, could not improvise or command on their own. Um, the average American can do that. The, uh, even if the offers are, you know, not around. Um, as I did, your military experience did it influence your thinking about war or about the military? Well, it. Now, I'll be very honest with you. People who disagree with me, I feel that a person out of high school should donate a year of their time in the reserve so that they come equipped in case of emergency where we do not lose people through, in, uh, through lack of training, etc. Plus, you're reinforcing our security. Uh, in this world today as in the past, you have to be able to defend yourself. And a year of service by a person just out of, out of high school would not interfere with too much with a person's life because you're not in college, you're not going to go into business, etc. And, and it also gives a certain amount of discipline which you must have to survive and to take care of yourself uh, and also passing on to a certain discipline to your offspring and make them try to be self-sufficient. I am very fortunate. I have two daughters. They're both college graduates. They both are able to take care of their self monetary. They've married well. They have beautiful grandchildren. Oh, they're not the best in the world. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say I'm partial. Uh, and they both have vocations if ever they need them. The older one is uh, her vocation being a teacher. Matter of fact, uh, being a high school instructor, I mean a college instructor in history, she, when she got out of High school, she turned it to be, uh, went to be a a uh, lab uh, X-ray tech. Then she got her degree in uh, X-ray, and uh, she started the program at Harper now, and she's in charge of it. Uh, so it has been beneficial to her. My eldest doesn't need yet uh, to go out looking for a job, but she has a vocation to fall back on, which every person should have. It should be instilled in their early life that they must. And that has been beneficial through the service. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. I need all I can get. <laughs> uh, is there anything else can help you with? Well, you speak so clearly and so coherently, and everything is organized. You've covered a lot of oh, that. Oh, well, that's what happening when you lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. Um, were there any particularly humorous, funny times? Was it Are all? You serve yeah, it? Was there any great laughs or? Uh, oh. I suppose that was funny the night you were celebrating the victory in Europe. That was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'll tell you something. We came home, I mean, we came to England on the Queen Mary, and we came home on a banana ship. And uh, 
it rained every night. So my buddy and I, we were going to go down below deck and sleep there. The odor was overwhelming, so we slept on deck. And we had our bed rows, and we uh, pre predict against the rain. Now, every morning, a um, minister used to have services where we were. He was Catholic, and I was Jewish, and the service was Protestant. So if we moved from there, we would never get our spot back because it was an ideal spot. So we were his, part of his congregation. <laughs> and I remember singing that song down, uh, come, come to the church. Yeah, and Wildwood, yeah. <laughs> and I remember we used to sing that all the time. <laughs> then we were one uh, day out of New York, and it was coming down heavy as hell. And there was an area that you weren't supposed to go into were life, uh, life belts. So the rain was coming down, we were getting wet. We said, the hell with it. We slept the time in the life uh, preserve area where it was dry. And um, that, was, that was it. Then... Um, you were singing hymns on a banana boat coming uh, back. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and rain beside. And the rain. It, it was, oh, it was something. Um, there are... Oh, this is, we were coming from Germany back to France, which was 125 miles. And we were in the 40 and 8s. You've heard of those, haven't you? Uh, 48 horses or 8 men. No, wait a minute, 8 men or 48 horses. And the Air Corps got to these things, and there were holes galore in it. And guess what? It took us five days to go 125 miles, and most of the time it was rain. And the rain would come through these holes, and we would have to use our sleeping bags, etc. It was a truck? No, no. A plane? Train. A train. Oh. See, a 48 is a uh, freight car. As they say, you put 48, horse, uh, eight, 48 human beings or eight horses in it. And um, I remember it was shot to hell where we were, this 40 and 8, and we had rain, and we would, took us five days to go 125 miles. Uh, the uh, tracks were pretty well shot to hell, and they had to go around. And I remember uh, we had our barracks bags with us, and every time we stopped, we would get French uh, civilians and they would buy anything we had. I had a pair of shoes that were two and a half years old, civilian shoes, and boy, they bought those, and blankets, army blankets, underwear. When we hit uh, our camp to go back home, we had very light bearing <laughs> Oh, uh, and there was many things that I had a cousin in Lahar who was in service, and I went out there to visit him. I hitchhiked all the way there. That was a hundred and some odd miles. And when I forgot, when I got there, I did not have his address where he was stationed. So what I had to do was go in reverse back to camp, and I didn't have a pass to go there. So if I was picked up, it was something. What was also very funny, I was on leave in um, Chicago, and the girl I was with, we went to the Aragon Theater, Aragon, yeah, the ballroom, yeah. ballroom, and we went upstairs to have refreshments. She ordered a highball, and I ordered a straight with a chaser. And the waitress said, can I see your ID card? I showed her, she said, you're not 21. You cannot have liquor. I said, I cannot have, here I spent 21 months overseas. I drank everything under the sun and I can't have liquor. I, she said, that's the law. I said, give me a milkshake. 
So I don't know if they we were leaving the Aragon and we were walking down the street and it was warm, so I took off my jacket. And sure enough, MP stopped, stopped me. They said, put on your jacket. I said, put on my jacket, I'm hot. Put on your jacket. So I put on my jacket and he said, now button it up. I buttoned it up. Where's your cap? I put on my cap. He said, okay, you can go. And here I had Hershey bars, which indicate time overseas. I had my medals and such and bars, whatever. That meant nothing to the MPs. But it was funny. But with the Aragon was the, was the kickle. Funny thing about it, another fellow and I, we were still on our leave. We went downtown and we stopped at a bar. They didn't ask my age. They said, what do you want to drink? I said, duh, 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 duh. it was funny as hell. But, uh, uh, and that's the funny thing. You have a girlfriend when you go into service, you come back and you see that you're not adjusted to the same adjustment. She had two and a half years of college in, and uh, I didn't. And uh, she was on her way to, uh, and I was just beginning. And uh, college changes an individual, it matures them to a great extent. She was, we remained very good friends, but uh, that was about it. And I, being 20, who wants to get engaged or go and study? Not at that age, not when you're, uh, you're not decided where you're going. If I went to medical school, four years of getting a, a bachelor, four years of internship, no, four years of medical, and then you had a, yeah, that wasn't it. Well, actually, I didn't get married until I was 32. And a lot of my friends, uh, uh, this fellow I was telling you about that put in 35 missions, uh, he told me something funny. He was going to study with this girl when he went into service, and he was corresponding with her. And what happens? He gets engaged, and his mother gives her a ring, and he didn't know about it until he got back to the States. <laughs> and a year later, he married. He, he was. 21, which was very foolish of him, because I, he was a very bright boy. And it, from when I talked to him years ago, when we were in Europe, he wanted to be a doctor. But getting engaged and married, that put an end to it. And uh, it's, it's a shame. But that's a uh, part of life. And then a good many of the fellows married in their 20s. There was only one fellow. He and I were very close. Uh, he married a, when he was 40. It was a funny thing. We used to go out together, you know, as go to uh, weddings and, you know, crash weddings and go to <laughs> dances and so on. And we used to kid around. Uh, be, you know, a couple, the two fellows. Well, Mike, this is my week to be the girl. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to have a lot of fun. And then uh, the craziest thing is when I got engaged, he was on a vacation and he came back and I told him I'm engaged. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'll introduce you to the girl. And he was surprised. And uh, when we got married, we had a visitor for supper every other week, but he, and he turned out to be a policeman, and he, uh, it's a he, matter of fact, he's one of the group that played poker, okay. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, here's a man 80 years old, and he has a 40-hour a week job. He's a security guard at the airport, O'Hare. He says, the reason I keep the job is to get away from my wife. 
and uh, it, he's young. I said, when the hell are you going to retire? Yeah, when they force me out. But he will not put in overtime, 40 hours and no. And, uh, and he's a very severe diabetic, but he's a hell of a good athlete. So playing golf keeps his diabetes down. And he watches his uh, uh, diabetes. I have a mild case of diabetes, knock wood. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, died very. Well, you both have great, uh, great constitutions. And, uh, oh, we, yes. That I think that helped you in the service, being, being you a know, healthy I'll, person. I'll yeah. tell you, very fortunate what the service has done for me. My doctors call me a miracle man. I've had two bypasses, operations. I've had a Whipple operation. I don't know whether you know what a Whipple is. They give you an insertion that, incision down here. They trimmed my pancreas. They took my, uh, what's the name out? Go, uh, gallbladder? Gallbladder out. They trimmed. Uh, they took a tumor out, and they took out part of my intestines. And 25% survived that. Well, I was on the 25%. And then um, I had that one bypass, and then a month later, I had half of a colon removed. And these doctors, didn't know how I survived at the age of 78. <laughs> I'm 80 years old. Well, you got great, uh, great and genes I, and a the, constitution. And, yeah. Uh, I think some of it, outlook has been through the service to come yeah. to think of it. Yeah. The survival area yeah. and how to adjust to what you got going. And I have a very good wife to, go to tolerate me. <laughs> Besides, and I have two gorgeous daughters, and as I say, four outstanding grandchildren. Congratulations, uh, Al. Yeah, I'm very, very fortunate person. Uh, I've lived a, a good life, and I cannot complain. Health-wise, I can't because I have recovered. Uh, looking at my family and what they have done gives, gives me great satisfaction. Then I, this relationship I have with these fellows, uh, it, I am, we have enough to s survive financially. And being a veteran is part of all that. Oh, uh... uh, yeah. Uh, it gives you, now, for instance, People are yelling about getting out of Iraq. I would like to see the troops out. But if you remove the troops, what do you got there? Chaos, real chaos. You have too many groups fighting one another. And what you did originally, no satisfaction out of it, or uh, satisfaction for the 2,000 that are dead. They died in vain. It's going to cost minor casualties to give them a stable government, but you just can't pull out. You learn that in the military, that you just can't pull out something just to pull out. You've got to leave a fir firm foundation. I hate to see all the money that we're wasting there. I hate to see the death toll of our people. Uh, but you made a commitment. Uh, we had ill uh, intelligent re reports, and we were too eager beaver to get in there for oil. And uh, what the first Bush, what any should have done the job properly, even though his allies wanted him to stop. And still, I don't know. Well. Politics is politics, and in next election, I don't know what we're going to get as a president. 
I hope we have a person who is more knowledgeable and more, shall we say, intelligent. Um, Clinton, with all his defects, was a very sensible, intelligent individual. Matter of what was it, he outflanked the Republican Congress that time? And he brought in young personnel. You got to bring in young personnel. You can't go rely on people that are my age or maybe a few years younger. You got to train the future. And the future is uh, people who are my daughter's generation. And the generation to come after that for survival. Well, I hope the uh, I hope the generations coming up are as uh, as effective as your generation was. You know, well, in serving you know this country. Well, you know why a lot of it was the GI Bill. Yeah, they were able to educate themselves. We have got good statesmen out of it. We got good uh, lawyers out, businessmen, and so on, because of the education, and that's very high of my priorities: education. When I get a uh, questionnaire, that's very high on my uh, agenda. Very high. Well, I hope I didn't bore you too much. No, not at all. But I, if there's, is there anything? If there's anything you want to, no, I think we've covered all the questions, um, and I feel like we've got a, a, a pretty good sense of, of your, your service years. Um, if there's anything you want to add later when I show you the transcript, we can we can do that. But I think we probably got enough to go on. Yeah. I gave enough. You gave enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Thanks, sorry. A, Thanks I'm a lot. Sorry I not at all. Much. Not at all. Not at all. It, uh, uh, it's it, all good. Thank you. You oh I see I gave you a label. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're we're picking up again now and uh, Al is going to be telling us as he recalls his duties in the hundred and third. Uh, with the 103rd uh, Battalion, my duty was first aid man, a stretcher bearer, ambulance driver, jeep driver, uh, clerical, and sometimes a chaplain. Um, the chaplain part was very uh, hard because you know the average person who wants a chaplain or on their last. But that that's where my duties were. In the Air Corps were the similar as, as that, but not as extensive. Uh, the Air Corps was a nine to five <laughs> job. And uh, but the the battalion sometimes was a twenty four, forty eight hour deal where you used to feel pretty punchy after a while. And there was periods of time where you had a hell of a break, too. With the old army saying is hurry up and wait. And that was it. Uh, that's about it. I think. Thank you. Thank you. For the, you. Uh, for the uh, 